On June the 8th, 1942, a man named Skip Agent was walking on train tracks in Chapel Hill, Tennessee. And this is the area where I was born and raised and grew up. But in 1942, Skip was walking at night with a lantern in his hand, and he was hit by a train that was running south from Nashville. Now, the engineer, after getting the train stopped, got off of the train, made his way to Skip's body just to watch him die. Now, as legend goes, as Skip was dying, the light from his lantern lift it to the sky and can still be seen in the same spot on these train tracks, hovering the tracks at night, watching the trains as they make their runs. This is called the the legend of the ghost light of Chapel Hill, Tennessee. I grew up around this sort of legend. Folks going to these train tracks, trying to find this light This story, there's actually a song about it. It was featured on some reality show. I think it was called Ghost Hunters. And people from all over the world travel to try to find this light. And to be honest with you, a lot of people claim that they saw the light. I don't know what it was. Some people became so fascinated with the light, they began to search up and down the train tracks and got hit by a train. And they saw the light, all right. But I would never go with my friends. Many friends went and on this little adventure to find the light of Chapel Hill. And I would not go. And this was a place that was really close to my grandparents' house. And so when we would go by this place, I just wouldn't look at night. I would not look because I didn't want to see this light. And I don't know what I was thinking as this light is going to possess me with something evil. I don't know. Uh, Maybe it was just if I see this light, then I have to deal with the fact that there is something mysterious over there, and then I have to deal with the fact, could that possibly be? Could ghost exist? Do I believe in ghosts? And so I just wouldn't look. I don't know if it was just fear or just trying to be a good Southern Baptist boy that you don't believe in ghosts and those sort of things. I don't know what it was. But... The Colossians believed in ghosts, all right. It, it wasn't the Casper-like ghost. Their religious system included all kinds of spirits. And, and we talked about last week these elemental spirits. They controlled life as you know it. There were spirits that had to do with your wealth, spirits that had to do with your crops, spirits that had to do with your home, spirits that had to do with commerce, spirits that had to do with everything. And many of these believers who have trusted in Christ, they're trying to figure out, okay, now what do we do with this spirit world? Is it real? Does it exist? They'd spend much of their life worshiping spirits, fearing spirits, thinking if they sort of climbed a ladder in spirituality, uh, they could do this by placating these spirits. And you became more spiritual the more spirits you controlled. And so they believed in ghosts, all right. And one group of false teachers mixed in with all the other false teachers in Colossae were called the Gnostics. And the Gnostics... When they talked about the spirit world, they used this term called fullness. That there's this spiritual realm out there called the fullness. And there's all kinds of knowledge out there in this world that most ordinary people don't have. And most ordinary people don't experience. But you can pursue fullness of knowledge. You can pursue a full experience now even more because you believed in Jesus. You've kind of got another notch in your belt, another rung on your ladder to know more and to experience more in the spiritual realm. And as we've said so many times, for these Gnostics, Jesus was just another angel, another spirit to experience And so Epaphras, the pastor in Colossae, 
He's trying to figure out, how do I address this false teaching? And he goes and he meets with Paul and he says, Paul, how do I shepherd people who believe in ghosts? How do I shepherd people who are talking about not just their houses that are haunted, but their prayer closets are haunted with all of these spirits from their past? And they're trying to figure out what to do with them. Paul, what do I do? And as we have said in this series, Paul says, Him you preach. Jesus as supreme. He is supreme above all other beings, above all other knowledge, above all other ritual, other tradition. Jesus is supreme. And your spirit world is no longer sufficient to do anything for you now that you have Christ. He says, in Christ, there is no higher knowledge. There's no plus or upgrade plans in Christ. It is Christ and Christ alone. There is no searching for some mysterious key to life in some realm far, far away. It is Christ. And knowing Him, you don't need to know anymore. Notice verse 9. In Christ, there is no more to know. Verse 9, he says, For in Him the whole fullness, there's that term, fullness, all knowledge, all understanding, for in Him the fullness of deity dwells bodily. Now we've talked over and over about the in Him theology that is throughout all of Paul's writings. That when we believe in him we are immersed into him and his death becomes our death and his life becomes our life and his resurrection becomes our resurrection and here he's going to apply this in him in Christ theology to this pursuing of this spirit world this knowledge that is out there he says you don't need to do that anymore notice for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily the full measure the completeness of all knowledge of all understanding has dwelt in Jesus Christ of Nazareth 100% man 100% God all deity dwells bodily remember the false teaching we talked about last week that with all of this spiritual understanding Gnosticism Jesus just became another spirit or the Christ spirit that came upon Jesus of Nazareth when he was born. Paul says, no, no, no. The Jesus of Nazareth that you know and follow in bodily form, all the fullness of God dwelt in him, meaning everything it takes to be God. What it means, the essence of God dwelt in his body, but notice the word dwells. It's present. Still dwells in Jesus. And so if you are in Christ, you have everything that you need in Christ. The fullness of God in Christ. He has been raised from the dead, a resurrected body at the right hand of God over and above any spiritual realm that you would try to placate to. No, he's God's risen king. And in him, what it means to be spiritual is summed up. What it means to know and experience God is summed up in Christ who has defeated death and rules and reigns now. And this is what he says in verse 10. And in him, you have been filled, meaning you have been completed. Trusting in him, his life, his death, his resurrection is yours. You don't need anything else in Christ. You have been made complete. Notice he continues to describe Christ here, who is the head of all rule and authority. So whatever spiritual world you're thinking about out there, whatever ghost world, whatever realm, Jesus is ruling and reigning above that. And to pursue any sort of secondary knowledge is to sell yourself short. Because you have everything you need to know in Christ, and there's no more to know. To know God, you need nothing more than Christ. To know the fullness of God, you need nothing more than Christ. But hear this, in knowing God in Christ, you need nothing more. 
You need nothing more to know God than to believe in Jesus. And when you believe in Jesus, there's nothing else to know that's outside of Christ. Remember, Paul says, he is the one who created all things and all things find their meaning in him. And so if you know him, you know the meaning of all things. And you know all knowledge is pointing to him. And so when you know him, you know what you need to know. He is sufficient. Now, why is this important? Paul's point here is spirituality is to know Christ. And then any, any pursuit of spirituality is simply to know more of Christ. That's what he's telling the Colossians here. If you want to pursue some sort of knowledge, you want to pursue some sort of experience, some sort of spirituality, you pursue Christ. And you have all you need to have in Christ, pursuing Him. Spirituality is summed up there. Now, how does that apply to us? That means any theology, any sort of discipleship, any sort of experience that you're after as a Christian has to be with the goal of knowing Christ more. Not knowing more than Christ. You see, a lot of Christianity today is simply baptized life hacks. We want life to be easier. We want life to be better. And so I need some tips for living. And it's okay if you baptize those with Jesus as long as it makes my life easier. Tell me how to manage my money. Tell me how to parent my kids. Tell me how to get along and communicate with my spouse. And we can have a lot of life hacks that we call spiritual that ultimately do not lead to knowing Jesus more. Do not, don't have anything to do with Jesus. And eventually, Jesus is irrelevant. And so any sort of knowledge and any sort of spirituality that we are after, any sort of practical living has to be in surrendering to knowing Christ. That's what I want to do. I want to pursue Christ. I want to know Christ and be found in Him. You see, a lot of us can begin to pursue the theology. And we get out here and we say, oh, I know a lot of theology. I know a lot of facts and Bible trivia about God. But you don't know Christ anymore. You just got a lot of facts in your head. Some of us can even begin to pursue experiences in worship. And we can even sing and talk about Jesus and have these wonderful experiences. But we don't know Christ more. And we can discipleship ourselves to death. We can go to a Bible study and a prayer meeting and we begin to accumulate this world of spirituality and it's even apart and over here away from Jesus and has nothing to do with Jesus. All of these things are channels and roads that should be leading us to know Christ because in knowing Him, we have everything that we could possibly want. Our sins forgiven, the promise that we'll be raised from the dead, that we are accepted by God, that Jesus wins in the end. And so we are pursuing Christ in all things, even in things that today we would say have nothing to do with Christ. We are pursuing Christ in understanding the world he created, how the world works, even in understanding how I work and understanding what goes on in my own mind, in my own heart, in my own life. When I am pursuing that knowledge, I am pursuing Christ. Why? He created me. And so make sure the knowledge, the spirituality, whatever it is you're pursuing is a pursuit to know Christ more, not to find something that is other than or more than Christ. Paul says his person is sufficient. His rule is supreme. In him, you have everything that you need to know before God and for eternity. So what has God done so that you would know Christ? Well, he's given you a heart transplant. We see this beginning in verse 11 where we see there is no more to know but Christ. And here there is no more to do because Christ has done it all. Notice verse 11. In him. Again, we see this theology. In him theology. We are found in him. He is supreme. And in him we have everything we need that is sufficient for life. But notice what he says. In him theology. 
you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. And remember, it wasn't just the Gnostics with this spiritual realm that you're pursuing, this knowledge, mystical knowledge. There were also false teachers that began to add traditions to the spirituality. Circumcision was one of those traditions. You may believe in Jesus as a Gentile, but if you're not circumcised, you're really not a part of the people of God. And here Paul says there is something better than physical circumcision that has happened to you when you believed in Christ. Notice he says in him you were circumcised. The word means to cut away. And here as he's referring to uh, circumcision, he refers to the sign that was first of all given to Abraham, a physical sign that Abraham was to give to his offspring. And then this is the sign of God's covenant with the people of Israel. They were to be circumcised, which is to say they were cut away from the rest of the world. And all of God's promises and his Messiah would come through them and the world would be blessed through them. They were cut away from the world. World to be holy given the promises of God. And so they took on this physical sign of circumcision. But he says the circumcision you know in Christ is not physical. Notice he says made without hands. This isn't something physical. In Christ something spiritual has happened to you. And notice he continues by putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ. The word putting away means to lay aside. It's like discarding a coat. You just set it aside. But notice the body of flesh. What is he referring to there? He is referring to our sin nature. The part of you that is hostile and rebellious to God. The sin nature that has been passed down from Adam that causes you to say, not I'm a creature, who must worship my creator, but I'm the center of the world. This, I'm going to do what I want to do. That part of you that rebels and is hostile to God, here, he says, has been put away. What he's saying here is in, in Christ, there's been another circumcision that has cut something away. And what is it? It is your rebellious heart. When you believe the gospel, God has stripped away. He has cut away that part of you that hates God, that rebels against God, that doesn't want to obey God. This is a spiritual circumcision, a cutting away when you are united to Christ. Being united to Christ, your sin nature and the Holy Spirit can't coexist. And so by the Spirit of God, He cuts that out of you. This was a promise in Deuteronomy 36 where Moses said, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart so you will love the Lord instead of rebelling against Him. Jeremiah 17, why do we need to have this circumcision of heart? Because the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. He says, who in the world can understand it? As soon as you think you understand your heart, oh, your heart is sinful and it's going to lie to you. And this part of you that rebels against God, he says, when you are united to Christ, has been cut out. In Ezekiel and Jeremiah, there's this glorious promise that God will take a people and He will take their hearts of stone from them and He will give them hearts of flesh that beat for Him, that love Him, that serve Him, that know Him, and that obey His law. They will not be able to obey Him unless He takes that part of them out. And He says when you believe in Christ, this is what happened to you. In Romans chapter 2, verse 29, Paul says, a Jew is one inwardly. And circumcision is a matter of the heart by the Spirit. And so Paul would say to these men who are telling you, now that you believed in Jesus as a Gentile, now you need to be circumcised and take on the other traditions. Oh, there has been a glorious, a glorious thing that has happened to your heart that no other tradition could do. God has cut your heart of stone out and He has implanted by the Spirit the gospel in there so that you love Him. No tradition can do this. 
not even baptism as we continue in verse 12. There is no more to do because God has given you a heart transplant. There is no more to do because God has buried who you used to be. Notice verse 12, having been buried with him in baptism. When you believe the gospel, you're given this new heart. There's something else that goes on here. And Paul refers to it as a burial. Notice you having been buried, put into the ground. But then he describes this burial with him in baptism. And the thing about the word baptism in our Bibles is it is always transliterated. It's not translated. When we read our English Bibles, the word is baptizo. And we just transliterate it over and over. If it was actually translated, the word means to immerse. It means to plunge under. And here, when he refers to this burial that has happened when we believed in Christ as baptism, he he refers to this, this practice where people would take their clothes and to dye their clothes, they would plunge them and die. And then they would raise them up And their clothes would be a totally different color. Why? Because the dye and the garment had become one. And you couldn't tell them apart. They were intertwined in every way. And he says, that's what's happened to you when you believed in Jesus. You were immersed into him by the Spirit of God. And you have become one with Christ. And you can't tell the two apart. This union of Christ This being immersed into Christ when you believe the gospel by the Spirit of God. He images this here with the act of a burial. Why does he do this? Because when you believed in Christ, you became one with Christ's death. Paul would say in Galatians, you were crucified in Christ. You became one with Him at His death on the cross for your sins. It is as though you died. You became one with His death. And so that person that was crucified with Christ, he says here, has been buried when you were united to Christ. Had been left in the tomb when you believed the gospel. You were united by faith with his death and your old self died. Your sin died and was buried in the tomb. Who you used to be died and was buried in the tomb. And now before God, you are covered in the righteousness of Christ, united to Christ, covered in his perfect life before God. And the old you was buried. But notice we've had a heart transplant, a burial, and then spiritual CPR. Once the old you has died, buried with Christ. This happens when you believe the gospel. You're identified with his death. Notice what happens. Notice in a burial and in a baptism, he says, in which you were also raised. Now, that's not supposed to make any sense. How was I raised in a burial? How was I raised in this plunging under? Notice, with him through faith. Notice all of this is about faith in Christ. It's not our works. It's not anything we are doing. God is doing this as we trust in Christ. There is this miraculous work that is going on that he describes here in the powerful supernatural working of God who raised him from the dead. Now here, death in Christ assumes resurrection with Christ. When you believe in Christ's death on the cross, it assumes you will be raised with Christ in His resurrection from the dead. You become one in those things. When you become one with Him, death in Christ assumes resurrection with Christ. Why is that? Because if the penalty for your sin has been paid, the curse for your sin can be lifted. The penalty is death. Jesus endures the wrath of God and dies for your sin. When you believe in Him, your sin has been paid. And so now you can be raised from the dead because the payment has been made. And here He says, when you identified with Him, you were buried, but you were also raised. It it is almost as those transactions are one. You die and you're resurrected at once when you believe in Christ. So union in Christ here does two things. It buries the old man and raises the new man. That's why at our baptisms we say, buried with Christ in baptism, someone has died, 
And then someone is left in the grave when we say, raised to walk in newness of life. See, our baptism is to symbolize this union with Christ. We've been immersed into Him, but then we've also been immersed into His death, burial, and resurrection, and that's what we symbolize in baptism. That's why baptism requires what Paul says here, a new heart. Someone who has actually been identified with Christ and has faith in Christ. That's why we only baptize believers. But baptism also requires this imagery of death, burial, and resurrection. Because that is what has happened to us in Christ. When we have received this new heart by faith, we have been killed, buried, and resurrected. And the old you is left in the tomb. A lot of times people say to me, you know, baptism is scary. Get in front of people, and then I'm scared of water. And I always say, it's supposed to be. It's your funeral. That's scary. It's a picture of someone dying. Baptism is also to be a celebration, though. Because you are raised up with Christ into new life. And so you celebrate that. There is an Easter that is happening before your eyes in baptism. But Paul continues to describe this work here in verse 13. When you were united to Christ, you who were dead in your trespasses. Here, you were dead with your old heart that did not love God, that did not beat for God, that did not care about God, that only cared about yourself. You were dead You weren't alive to God. You weren't alive to Christ. But notice in your trespasses, it wasn't as though you were cold and dead. Your dead heart was alive to something. And what was it? Serving yourself. Your trespasses. Living for yourself here. The word means to fall aside. It means to go off course. And you lived to rebel against God and do your own thing. And that's what your heart told you to do. And so you were dead in your trespasses. You couldn't do anything about it. He says, and the uncircumcision of your flesh. He refers here to the fact that Gentiles were separated from God by flesh. They weren't Jews. And that's who you were spiritually, no matter where you're from. Before you believed the gospel, you had a dead heart and you were rebelling against God and you were separated from God spiritually. You're alienated from him because of your sin. That's who you were. And what did you do about it? Nothing. Notice the next part of the verse. God made alive. God made alive. For those of you here today who really understand your sin, you really understand who you were, you know that had to happen for you to be here today loving and serving Christ because you wouldn't have done it any other way. God made you alive. He took your heart of stone out and gave you a new heart. He took the hostile heart out and gave you a heart that loves and serves God. He cut from your flesh this heart of stone. He buried you and he resuscitated you by his spirit. That's why when you come before God, there's nothing more for you to do because you couldn't do it anyway. This means we walk in grace and humility before God. There's no spiritual swagger. If you're saved here today, you know you didn't save yourself. And if you think you saved yourself, you're not saved. You're not. You're still dead in your sin. If you say, oh, it's the way I was raised. I was just a special person. This is all the things that I used to do for God. That didn't save you. That couldn't save you. You needed God in Christ by the power of his spirit to wake you from the dead and give you his spirit and save you. And so you can't come here today with any kind of spiritual swagger. You don't walk in here and you say, look at all I do for Jesus. Oh, you wouldn't want to do it without Jesus. He changed your heart. You can't come in here and compare yourself to others. Well, I just have a unique relationship with God and I just know more than these people. Oh, you wouldn't know God if he didn't make you alive. You can't look at the world around you and say, look how awful all these people are. They're so deranged and they're so wicked. And yes, you would be too without a supernatural work of God in your life. And this is why we get on our knees and pray for our friends and family to be saved. 
Because I can't do it. I can't give you enough advice. I can't give you the right things to do. And so I preach the gospel and then get on my knees and beg God by the power of his spirit to save you, to change your heart, to give you faith in Christ that loves and serves him and only hopes in him. It's a supernatural work of God and there's no more for us to do in Christ. Then he continues, there's no more to pay. When all of this happened, he says, having forgiven us of our trespasses, when you believe in Christ, you are released from the guilt of your sin and trespasses, your rebellion against God that deserves hell and deserves damnation. You are released from that. How? Verse 14, by canceling the record of debt that stood against you with its legal demands. Here he refers to this certificate of unpaid debt, an IOU. And during this time when people couldn't pay their debts, they would take a, a, a piece of paper, and it's not like the paper that we have now. It's usually made out of animal skin, and they would write on that paper something like, I owe you this or whatever, however much, and they would give that to the person that they owed, and then they would try to work off their debts. Now, the way this was done is so often the, the ink used during this time, it did not sink in to the leather or paper and it could easily be wiped off and then you could just use the paper again and this is the image that Paul wants us to have in our mind that the reason you have been released of your debt is because God has wiped the IOU off the certificate that says you owe God infinite hell for your sin When Jesus died on the cross, here the word means it was blotted out. And he picks up on some Old Testament imagery where the blood of bulls and lambs and goats were sprinkled on things and blotted on things to cover them. And he says the record of wrong that you have before God, which is his law and all the ways you've disobeyed his his law, every one of them, every day of your life earns you infinite judgment. And when you believe in Christ on the cross, it is as though God takes the blood of Christ and blots that IOU out and it is canceled. it's, It's gone. It doesn't exist anymore. It's clean. This is the first century delete button. It's over. It doesn't exist. It's gone. It's as though it never happened before God. And the question is, if there's no more to pay, why do you keep rewriting your IOU to God? Some of you are doing that right now. You come in here today and you say, I want to delight in the gospel, but I remember all of these things that I did in my past. Oh, you delight in the gospel today because God has blotted that out. Stop rewriting it. Notice he continues, then he set aside this record of wrong. He has set it aside. He's blotted it out and he has put it somewhere else. Where has he put it? Nailing it to the cross. Again, he has cut it out, put it to the side, nailed it to the cross. And the imagery here is what happened when when a criminal was crucified above their head were the things they did wrong. And so if you were an insurrectionist against the Roman government, That was written above your head. If you were a thief, some sort of criminal, whatever crime you were guilty of. And Jesus, we see king of the Jews because he was guilty of blasphemy. But all of your sin and your record of wrong deserves to be nailed above your head for eternity. And as you endure God's just wrath forever and ever and ever above your head, guilty of sin against a holy and righteous God, trespasses every one of them above your head. And what Paul says is, no, no, no. At the cross, your record of wrong was nailed above Jesus' head. And he died for your sin, and he's the only one who could pay it in full. And so it can be set aside because it was nailed to the cross. And if your sin hung over the head of Jesus, why do you continue to allow it to hang over your head? Why? Why are you being haunted by those ghosts? 
Why? There's no more, there's no more to pay. It's gone. It's over. You trust the blood of Christ. It's canceled. It's already been crucified. Paul says there's no more to pay here. And then he says there's no more to fear. Notice when all of this happens at the cross, notice, and this should not be disconnected from the work of the cross. Notice, there's no more to fear. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. And so we go back to that thought of this spiritual world of angels and spirits that, that maybe hang over our head and, and, and okay, I'm not going to have food this week unless I worship this angel. I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to be able to take care of my family unless I worship our patron spirit. And this is what the believers in Colossae are struggling with. And he says, no, Jesus paid it all. And when he did that, if there's any power that these forces have against you, notice verse 15, he disarmed them, the rulers in authority, whether it's men or spirits. But notice even more, he put them to open shame and he triumphed over them. See, in their mind, they have a picture here when an emperor was overthrown. The people who defeated the emperor will often have parades. And in their cities, they would find statues and pictures of, of the defeated emperor. And they would bring those statues and pictures out into the streets and they would parade them around. They would probably draw things on them. They would humiliate the defeated emperors. And then the people who had been captured, they would be brought out into the street and there'd be celebrations. We own you now. We defeated you. We are your rulers. And he says, this is exactly what Jesus did to the forces of darkness at the cross. He has drugged Satan out into the street and defeated him and humiliated him. He has took on the forces of darkness and paraded them around for the world to see at the cross and in a resurrection. He has took all the power that Satan, let's say the chief angel and the chief spirit, would ever have over you, he's taken it away from him. See, Satan and the forces of darkness, they play warfare with us in humiliation and fear. They humiliate us with our past guilt. And they invoke fear in our hearts of death. Now, if Jesus has died for all of your sin, they have no power over you. Anything they say is null and void. And if Jesus is raised from the dead, you have no reason to fear death. And so Satan comes to us the same way he came to Adam in the garden. And he so often says this, has God really said? Has God really said to you, you're forgiven? This is where spiritual warfare exists in our life. Has God really said you are forgiven? What about that thing that you did? What about that season in your life where you made all those horrible mistakes has God really forgiven you of that? Has God really said? And then just like Adam in the garden, has God given you enough? He's telling you not to eat of this one tree. Has he really given you enough? Well, he's given you a whole world, given you a whole garden. And yet God has given you enough in the gospel and you know what Satan is going to say to you. Has he given me enough on the tree? <laughs> Dying for my sin. Has he given me enough? Has he really given you enough? This is how Satan comes into our life. What's going to happen to you when you die? Look at the hopelessness all around you. Look how pathetic it is. And you're headed to the end. This is spiritual warfare. And Paul would say to us today, it's okay to believe in ghosts. You probably should believe in ghosts because the spiritual world is real. Satan and the forces of darkness exist. But because of the cross... You have no reason to fear them. They have no power over you because nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ. But because of Christ, it's not okay to believe the ghost in your own head who is telling you today, Jesus hasn't done enough. He hasn't done enough. And you shouldn't be scared to look at them. You shouldn't be scared to look at that person who is saying that to you and believing the ghost in their head and reminding them in Christ. That's a legend of a man that died a long time ago. 
That's a legend of a woman that died a long time ago and was buried 2,000 years ago in Christ. Do you believe in ghosts? The question is, do you believe in Christ? Christ? 